Today we're making lion's head meatballs, and I had made it on this channel before. I made them a couple of years ago, as an Earth Kingdom dish, in a series dedicated to Avatar The Last Airbender. And while that version was made with pork, I decided to make this one with lamb, so naturally I will go to the slaughterhouse across the street to get some. Highly recommend Berry and Sons in Eastern Market if you're ever in town and you need some fresh lamb. There is a mishmash of other ingredients, some of them are just left over from other recipes that I'm reusing, and others are more important. So when I make lion's head meatballs, it generally varies what I put in them, but I always include two things. First one being is water chestnuts, which is what I'm peeling right now. Water chestnuts kind of peel like apples do, where you can just like keep the knife where it is and kind of turn the water chestnut towards the knife. That's probably the safest way to do it. You can also buy them canned, which is fine if you only want the water chestnut texture. Fresh water chestnuts are really sweet and starchy and just super enjoyable to eat. And it adds a wonderful sweet crisp element to anything you add it to. The canned stuff has a texture, but unfortunately it doesn't have that sweet intenseness of flavor. But I'll always say that having canned stuff is better than not having anything at all. So if that's all you got, then go for it. Because we're making meatballs, everything should be diced pretty small or minced. You can see I'm doing it pretty roughly, keeping things mostly even, but not really like killing myself over it. Because this meatball is so big and so tender, having like larger pieces of water chestnuts there to kind of like break up the monotony of, uh, I guess, mouthfeel, just maintains some textural interest and makes the meatball more enjoyable to eat overall. Next, we're gonna grate some ginger. And this is a ceramic grater that I have, and it's really uh, fantastic. I think this might have been originally meant for fresh wasabi, though I'm not sure. But again, for ginger and garlic, they're fantastic because they're easier to clean than a micro pane. And it just does a really good job separating the ginger fibers from the pulp. That's just a fun little trick I like to use for peeling garlic. My therapist also says it's really beneficial for managing my rage. I'm just kidding, I only need a therapist, I don't have one. Now with the way that I'm grating, you're wondering maybe that my fingers might just smell like garlic all the time, which if they did, you're welcome. But no, all you have to do after grating garlic to get the garlic smell out of your fingertips is just rub them on anything that's made of stainless steel and the garlic smell just goes away. They actually sell steel soap for this purpose, but that's a scam because you have so many things in your kitchen that are made of stainless steel already. There's no need to buy anything else for that. At this point, it's just whatever I want to put in. So I have some scallions, I have some Napa cabbage from another video that was left over. And finally, some parsley, which is specific to this lion's head meatball recipe because parsley pairs really well with the gaminess of lamb. Now, this is a trick that I learned from the Shanghai Club in Hong Kong for their lion's head meatballs. The chef puts tofu in and mixes it in with the meat. And what that gets you is a juicy and tender meatball that is so ridiculously big, it doesn't make sense, which is why the dish in itself is so grand and dramatic. To flavor the dish, we're gonna use some light soy sauce and some Chinese five spice, of course some cumin, because we're using lamb. And while this is not entirely necessary, I use two eggs to act as a binder. You can also use a cornstarch slurry. It would probably result in a more tender meatball if you did. Now the first step to cooking a lion's head meatball, at least this version of one, is to deep fry it. Because oftentimes the meatballs are so big and so tender, boiling them or poaching them right away might put them at risk of breaking. Frying them does a really good job and solidifying the outer layer really quickly so that it keeps the rest of it intact. And it also caramelizes the outside of the meatball so that it has a nice deep and rich flavor. In my opinion, it also gives it a really nice color. Frying it actually doesn't take that long because remember, you're not trying to cook it all the way through. If you did that, the outer layer would be completely burnt before the inside was fully cooked. I usually just fry it, basing the tops that stick out with more oil as I go until it's nicely brown and then I take them out. You might be looking at this meatball and thinking to yourself, hey, this looks like it might be keto, to which I say, I don't do that shit, so I don't fucking know. To shape the meatballs, you kind of just roll them in between your hands very quickly and lightly. You don't want to compress anything because you don't want things to be all that firm. You want it to maintain its tender shape. So you're basically just shaping the meatball. You're not pressing it in any kind of way. If you do a lot of deep frying, you'll know that using this much oil can get really expensive. So this is how I save my frying oil so I can use it a couple of times over before I eventually have to get rid of it. So a lot of restaurants will use these. They make these paper cones that allow you to filter out your frying oil. That little base is meant for this purpose as well. All you have to do is turn the paper cone inside out so it keeps its shape and you either ladle or you pour in the oil while it's still hot into another container and it will filter it out really well 
well. I think they're called frying oil paper or frying oil filters. So interrupting that kitchen tip with this kitchen tip, always deep fry with your wok if you can. If it's made out of carbon steel or cast iron, it will actually thank you. So you can see the papers work pretty well. If you do a lot of deep frying, it is really worth it to save your oil. So now we have to actually cook the rest of the meatball through. So what we're gonna do is cook it in a broth. Why did I lift the lid up like that? You can see here, I'm gonna use some of my superior stock from the previous video and it's gonna taste so much better because of it. Adding some pretty simple aromatics, some ginger, some scallions. If you don't have any superior stock, some chicken powder and some water with those aromatics will be totally fine too. It'll still taste really good. The liquid to a boil, then put the meatballs in and then reduce to a simmer and then allow to cook until they all start floating up to the top of the broth. It's not floating, that one's just resting on some other meatballs, but they will all start floating when they're done. I'd say around like 45 minutes. Coming back to our side quest, we had just made a very large log of ginger scallion butter, which as it turns out, is really fun to throw around, just like you. And the first thing I'm gonna cook with it is simply some buttered noodles. I decided on this as being the first dish to try this out with because in the case of butter noodles, noodles are literally just a vehicle for butter. And I wanted the opportunity to really let the butter shine. And also buttered noodles are kind of like the dish that you cook children or really picky eaters. So I just thought it would be funny to do it on my channel. Besides salt, the only extra thing that I'm putting in the noodles is some of the parsley that we had also put in the lamb meatballs. This is the only difference between children buttered noodles and adult buttered noodles. The adults will get parsley because if you're a grown ass man eating buttered noodles, we got to get a leaf in there somehow. I know I'm just kind of rambling and talking about the process, but I never once thought in my mind that somebody's gonna need instructions on how to make butter noodles. But let's do it anyway to cover all my bases. First, you cook the noodles to al dente, and then you warm some butter over a nonstick skillet if you have a nonstick skillet, and then you just toss the noodles in the butter and serve. You can mix in a couple of teaspoons of pasta water if you want to, you can add parsley if you want to, you can add a little bit of salt if you want to. At the end of the day, it's buttered noodles. I am not going to tell you how to eat those. Returning back to our meatballs, you can see how much of a difference there is when they are done cooking. For reference, this is when they were just put in. They're all sunk into the bottom except for the one that's resting on the other meatballs. And this is what they look like when they're all done. They are all on their own volition, just floating almost halfway above to the top. Why that might be, I'm not completely sure, but I suspect it has something to do with the fact that like the meat is cold when it's raw and when it's hot, it is it expands and therefore it's more buoyant and it floats at the top. I'm, I just made that up, I don't know. More importantly, look how tender the meatball is. It's fully cooked all the way through. All I needed was just to poke it with a spoon. It is so, it, I remember this. This was so good, look at that. Oh my God, that's so good. And also the broth was incredible. The meat cooked into the broth, but it also clarified the broth. So it was like super clear and brown and delicious. If you are not a fan of lamb, traditionally this is made with ground pork, which has a different texture and a much more subtle flavor. I'm more interested in using a beyond or impossible ground meat replacement from the next time I use this. I'm really interested to see if this could be done in a vegan way with just as delicious results. Watching this seriously just made me so hungry. I highly recommend this recipe if you have the time. It's so worth it. 